In the Masters of the Air combat clips, we see bomber formations under attack from ground artillery flak and enemy aircraft. The intent of this video was to view the optimum placement of B-17 bomber armor to maximize the chances of crew survivability. The results of the review may surprise you, as it did me, and I don't get surprised much. This chart outlines the sources of the 8th Army Air Force's heavy bomber losses based on a declassified Office of Statistical Control document titled Army Air Force's Statistical Digest in World War II. The data is valid for both B-17s and B-24s, 8th Army Air Forces operating out of Great Britain. The losses due to enemy aircraft and flak can be plotted for ease of discussion. The key takeaway of the chart is that fighters were more of a bomber threat up to June 1944, the month of D-Day, and flak was more of a threat after June 1944. There are lots of reasons for the shift in threat source. Mainly, the shift away from fighters is due to blind bombing, availability of long-range fighter escorts, escort tactic policy change, attrition of the German Air Force, and German fuel shortages. These factors have been covered in the channel's previous videos. Depending on the weapon used, bomber damage and losses can be from shock blast, penetration, or incendiary. Penetration damage can come from projectile fragmentation and splinters, or bullets. Some weapons will combine the damage source like armor-piercing incendiary bullets. To maximize bomber survivability, bombers were designed with armor, mostly in positions to protect crew members and vital systems from flak fragments, bullets, and 20mm splinter projectiles. This image from a 1945 B-29 flight and operational manual outlines the armor panels and transparencies of the B-29 bomber. Most of the armor protection is centered around the crew members and the central fire control system. The tail gunner's armor transparencies are constructed of three laminated layers of two-inch thick glass, as shown in this image. This chart from a 1945 Liberator pilot training manual shows the plane's armor and glass locations, thickness of plates, and zones of protection. The steel armor panels vary in thickness from a quarter inch to seven-eighths of an inch. The B-17's armor plates range in thickness from 0.125 to 0.6 inches. Notice that the bomber's armor locations are mostly designed from projectiles fired from the rear of the bomber. All of the B-17's armor is sized to resist penetration from a 30 caliber bullet. Both the cockpit windshield and the tail gunner sighting window are constructed from bullet-resistant glass. The pilot, co-pilot, and radio operator seat backs are fabricated from a 0.30 inch thick steel plate. The ball turret's lower frame and seat are fabricated from 0.25 and 0.6 inch thick armored plates. The waist gunner window frames are surrounded by armor plates to protect from projectiles coming from the side. There's a lower plate, transverse shield plate, and an upper plate. This chart shows the location of the waist gunner armored plates. The tail gunner is also protected by armor plates from rear firing attacks. This page outlines a study that was conducted by the 8th U.S. Army Air Forces outlining combat lessons learned from an August 1944 Commanding General 20th Air Forces document titled Combat Losses and Damage in the 8th Air Force. The purpose of the document was for the 8th Army Air Forces to share their two years of bomber combat experiences and lessons learned with the 20th Air Forces who were just starting their bombing campaign against Japan. The scope of the study was to analyze the causes of bomber losses and damage with the intent to make recommendations to bomber hardware and tactics to reduce losses and damage, evaluate and weigh the recommended changes with regard to cost and combat effectiveness. Details of the damage sustained by returning bombers was documented. The data tabulated included location, direction, cause, and severity of hit. The holes on every returning bombers were assessed, reflecting some 25,000 bomber evaluations. To minimize survivor bias, interviews were conducted with crews whose bombers were lost over occupied Europe. These interviews were crew members who were either repatriated or escaped POWs. They provided data on the circumstances of their lost bomber. Other attempts to account for survivor bias by relying on eyewitness accounts from other bombers in the formations were deemed unreliable. They tended to grossly underestimate the effect of flak on falling out of formation and becoming a straggler. Over 800 of these types of interviews were conducted to get a full picture on the cause of bomber loss. Returning crew member interviews represented bombers lost on combat mission enhanced the reliability by minimizing database survivor bias. The findings of the study include, flak by far causes most bomber damage. Flak gunners do not aim at individual aircraft. They aim for the projectile to detonate in the center of the formation. 
you would expect an even distribution of flak damage based on the bomber's exposed projected areas. This is not the case. The following bomber damage patterns are observed. Twice as many strikes occur from below the bomber rather than on the top surfaces, and the lower surface flak fragments travel at a faster velocity. Bomber armor would be more effective if placed on the floor of the bomber. Based on this data, the waste gun station side armor was ill-advised. Hits from flak. Spent bullets, shell casings, and links strike the front of the bomber more than any other location. The bomber's front-facing surfaces were damaged well beyond in proportion to its exposed area. If you add the damage from head-on attacking enemy aircraft, it becomes clear that key personnel and systems should be placed in the rear of the bomber and armor protection should be concentrated at the front of the bomber, protecting vital crew members and systems. An evaluation of 3,000 enemy aircraft machine gun and cannon hits lead to the following conclusions. The distribution of enemy aircraft gun and cannon fire is evenly distributed over the bomber relative to the area of exposure. There was no clustering of hits on the fuselage or wing root area. This implies while German pilots may try to aim at what might be considered vital locations of the bomber, but are unable to concentrate their gun and cannon fire at those locations. Bomber hits are by chance. Based on the results of the bomber damage and loss evaluation, where survivor bias has been taken into account, several lessons emerge for the 21st Army Air Forces to consider. The B-17's greatest vulnerability to enemy gun and cannon fire is the bomber's engines. Over 50% of bombers lost were stragglers, mostly due to engines knocked out. 75% of bombers lost had one or more engine out. Much of the engine combat damage could, been, could have been mitigated by adding engine armor. To save bomber crew lives, you need to reduce stragglers. Therefore, it makes more sense to allocate armor protection to the engines rather than to the crew stations. Shifting armor from crew stations to engines would need to take into account the effect this would have on crew morale, though. So, instead of bomber armor at these locations, the bomber should be armored like this, as this would likely save more lives. When enemy aircraft attacks are heavy, two-thirds of bombers that were lost had fires. Fire and fear of explosion were the primary reasons for bailouts. This premise is reinforced on this chart from a 1945 Army Air Forces Board report titled Parachute Questionnaire Project, where the Air Force surveyed flyers who bailed out. 838 B-17 crew members who bailed out were questioned. 43.8% jumped because of fire. 6.6% engine failure. 7.8% flak. 17% fire damage. 16.8% pilot order. And 8% other. 50% of bomber fires start in the engine nacelles. This is due to fire starting in this area and the fire spreading to the wing tanks, which lead to an explosion. A more effective fire extinguishing system would help mitigate nacelle fires. Engine armor, which would reduce stragglers and losses, would also contribute to mitigating fires. Interesting to note that the heavily armed YB-40 bomber escort concept did include engine armor, as discussed on this YB-40 configuration memo. The engines were shielded by 687 pounds of armor out of the 2,154 pounds of armor total. In February 1944, General Arnold requested that General Spots investigate the YB-40 engine armor requirements likely to include adaptation to the B-17s in service. Unfortunately, I cannot find any follow-up data to where this request led. In summary, the B-17's armor locations were selected based on crew protection from aircraft attacking mainly from the rear or sides. To protect the crew, armor should be placed accounting for projectiles originating from the front and below the bomber, or better yet, expend the armor weight penalty on engine protection only. This will minimize both stragglers and or engine fire, increasing the likelihood of bombers staying in formation and crew survival. Did any of the study findings surprise you? If you found this bomber armor location study review informative, please consider liking, commenting, and or subscribing to the channel World War II U.S. Bombers.